Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. In preparation for making the immediate denture, the posterior teeth have been extracted and uh, healing allowed to take place in the areas of the extraction site. And as you can see from this cast, this has been accomplished. Maybe uh, this represents possibly two or three months. And then the anterior teeth have been left in place in the mouth so that the patient um, can go uh, in, in his daily task and work and so forth without being a dentulous. Of course, he receives no function because he's lost his posterior teeth, but uh, one of the advantages of the immediate denture service is the fact that he doesn't look edentulous. Now, there are several ways to make the final impression for the maxillary immediate denture, and everything we say for the maxillary denture uh, holds true for the mandibular immediate denture, and we do make uh, immediate dentures for the mandibular arch also. Now, the first method of making a final impression is, of course, simply to take a stock tray and use an elastic impression material such as the uh, uh, irreversible hydrocolloids and make an impression and make the denture from that. And there have been trays especially designed, such as this one, the McGowan tray, um, made by the Co. company. And you'll notice that it has a portion in the posterior area that conforms to the edentulous arch. And then a well has been formed in the anterior portion, which conforms, looks like the trays that you have for uh, dentition. So it's a combination of both of these. And using a tray such as this with uh, minor uh, changes, adaptations with wax, for instance, we have a high palate, so we add a little wax in the, in the palatal area, and then uh, we might want to get some more height in this area. Um, make somewhat of a custom tray from the stock tray, and then simply make an impression in the mouth with uh, alginate. This is one of the methods. It's the easiest method. Unfortunately, it's probably the most commonly used method for making the final impression for the immediate denture. But we can make better impressions using a couple of different methods, so let's look at a couple of different types of trays. One is the type of tray that we will use in this course um, that is the custom acrylic resin tray, a custom tray for the individual patient. And this will, we will do in this exercise, and this will be demonstrated today. So we'll talk a little bit more about this in a few moments. But as, as you can obviously see, it is simply a tray that does fit the particular case with what you are working with. Now there is still another method that is a little more involved yet, and that is uh, making a sectional tray for the immediate denture. And as you can see, I'll disassemble this. Uh, the way this is done is the mouth is prepared such as this. This is an actual case. I've just saved the trays. And then trays are made in sequence. A posterior section is made. And then an impression is taken just of the edentulous area. It does not involve the undercuts around the teeth that remain in the mouth. And then a second portion tray is made, which, when placed in the proper position, incorporates the area of the undercut around the teeth. And the hole in the middle is just to make sure that the first part of the impression hasn't slipped in the mouth when the second portion is made. And the sequence is fairly obvious. In this type of impression, the uh, edentulous portion is made first. And in this case, we can use one of the zinc oxide eugenol paste where we have full control of all the borders, and it's not a one-shot one shot type of impression such as the uh, alginate in a stock tray. As a matter of fact, we can even go back in and, and put the functional post-am on the uh, uh, final wash, and we have all the controls with this posterior section that we do in a fully edentulous arch. And then, in the mouth, the completed impression goes back into the mouth, and the anterior uh, section is loaded with the uh, alginate, for instance, and placed into the mouth right over the first tray. And then when that sets, 
the entire assembly comes out together in a uh, fully completed final impression. Now this we use occasionally in the uh, senior clinic if the student is interested. What we normally use is the second tray that we're showing you, and this is what we will do for our exercise. So at this time, I will go ahead and uh, demonstrate the exercise that you will complete in a few moments in the laboratory. Now you all have been given a set of models. And the uh, maxillary master cast, as you know, has the six remaining teeth in place represented by the stone teeth. And you will also notice that their uh, ridge is very irregular because this particular patient was treated relatively soon after the extractions. Normally we don't do it this soon. But the posterior teeth have been extracted and for aesthetic reasons um, the patient is, uh, still has the anterior teeth in place. The first thing that we do is mark the posterior border of the denture so our tray is not too overextended. And this is relatively easy to do. The first thing that we do is locate the hamular notch. And I want you to do this on your cast in the exercise also. Um, the hamular notch is very easy to see on most casts. If there is no tuberosity and much resorption, locating the hamular notch on a cast is very difficult. But in most cases, if you've taken a good preliminary impression, and we will consider this a preliminary working model, uh, it's easy to determine. And then we mark an area in the midline. Now the fovea are not distinct in this case, so we will just have to do this by um, inspection. And you can use the guidelines that I'm giving you here. So we mark the middle area and then simply connect and draw a line across the posterior part of the palate. And this gives us a guide as to how far posterior to make the tray. Now because we are using alginate to make the final impression, or we usually use alginate in the clinic. We want some space between the surface of the mouth and the tray, the customer acrylic tray. So as a general rule, we will use one thickness of the base plate wax as a spacer in the edentulous portion of the cast. And because we have undercuts, and sometimes they are more severe than the one that you have uh, as an example for this exercise, but as a general rule, we use two layers of wax in the area where the teeth remain. And this will be demonstrated in a few moments when we actually uh, make the spacer and make the tray. So the first step is to uh, warm a sheet of base plate wax. And this will be adapted to the edentulous portion of the cast. Let's do this in two steps. We'll do the edentulous portion first and then put the extra sheet of wax around the teeth as a second step. Now don't let the wax stretch too much. Let it get soft enough so you can adapt it to the palate without, uh, without stretching it. And another thing that I should point out here is sometimes when you are adapting wax in this much bulk, it's easy to trap air bubbles in, in the mid palatal area. And if that, if that is the case, you might have end up with, and not spot it, you might end up with uh, an acrylic resin tray that's uh, half an inch thick. So if you do find the air bubble or a place where air is trapped, we simply, uh, with a spatula, go through that area and make a hole in it, let the air escape, and then adapt the wax back down. But the important thing for the first step is to thoroughly, thoroughly adapt the wax to the edentulous portion. Now, because we're going to have two layers of wax around the teeth, there's nothing wrong with running the wax up onto the teeth uh, in this step. Now the next thing to do, of course, is simply to go around the peripheries and remove the wax. And this does take a few minutes, so in order, I'm just going to start this, and then we'll go off camera for a moment while I finish this step. Now most of the excess wax has been uh, trimmed at this time, but I have left a little on the posterior area. Now we can see the line right through the wax. So as a guide, with a warm spatula, let's just go right down the posterior area and remove the last portion of excess wax. Now as a final step for the posterior area, 
let's seal the seal the wax to the master cast. And there's no need to run this wax out onto the edge of the boxing edge. Now this doesn't have to be absolutely perfect and absolutely smooth because all it is is simply a spacer. It's going to provide space underneath our custom acrylic tray. So once this step has been completed to this point, and we are, are certain that we have good adaptation to the cast, we can go on to the anterior area. Now, some of this wax has lapped over, and I think the best thing to do in this, in, in this uh, situation is to complete the area that has not been fully covered. Let's complete that with one layer of wax, and then we'll add the second strip to get our second layer as a separate step. And if we don't do this, uh, we lose track of how many thicknesses we have, and pretty soon we have some areas that are very thin and some areas that are very thick. And we want an even space under this tray. So what we're going to do here is hopefully end up at this point with about one layer of base plate wax. Now, there's a couple areas where we really haven't completed it yet, but at this time, we will go back in with the spatula and smooth the, the wax. And this should represent, at this point, what you're looking at here, this should represent one thickness of base plate wax over the areas of the teeth. Now, it's normal uh, to find a greater amount of undercut around the distal of the cuspid than any other place. So sometimes it is important to add a little more wax in this area where we have larger undercuts. The, the tray must be able to be inserted into the mouth without scuffing or impinging upon any tissues. So depending on the case, where there are larger undercuts, we're just going to need more blackout, that's all. Now at this point, the entire tissue surface is covered with one layer of pink base plate wax. Now for the second step, let's go in and add one more layer of the wax. This will give us a couple millimeters of space over the area of the teeth. Now you can see I've gone about to the cuspid area. I'm draping that over the teeth and we'll go back to the, uh, we want to go back to the linguals of the teeth also. So at this point, we can cut the excess wax at the lingual of the teeth and simply continue adapting. We don't really need as much as I had there, so I'm simply removing wax where I think I'm going to have uh, an excess. There are no large undercuts in this particular case, so I believe as a guide, um, everybody should use just the two thicknesses over the teeth in this particular case. And once again, we seal the wax to the master cast so it doesn't get cold and, and actually change its shape and come loose from the cast because if that happens and we don't spot it, and if we don't observe this and we adapt our tray over, over a cast with too much block out, we have a, an acrylic tray that really does not help us too much. If there is a problem with having too much block out, and at this point, we are nearly done. There's one thing that I would like to point out here, and that is in the labial area of this tray, you will notice from this view that the contour of the wax follows the contour of the teeth. That is, the wax is not brought out to the boxing edge or even further. And this is easy to do this at first. This is an undercut, but remember, we have a draw on this tray. We don't need to block out all of this undercut by filling this whole area with wax. There's only two areas, two thicknesses of base plate wax here, as well as up by the teeth. So don't, do not fill this whole area in with wax because we get too much. We have the tray ending up too far away from the tissue, and therefore the tray will not help us if that happens. Now, the final step is to make some stops in the tray. So in order to do that, we simply expose the tips of a couple of teeth 
three or four teeth. And what I'm doing here is exposing the cuspid tip on one side. I'm going to expose the cuspid tip on the other side of the arch. And don't expose too much because if you, if you abs, uh, actually expose enough so that the acrylic resin can uh, adhere to an undercut in the tooth, then you break the tooth off. And the, even though this is a preliminary model, uh, it is desirable to keep these teeth intact. Now I'm also exposing a little bit of the incisal edge of the central incisor. Now I'm going to show you a step here that is used in the clinic maybe 50% of the time. Some instructors do not prefer that you make a soft tissue stop, uh, and some do. And what I'm going to demonstrate here is how to make a soft tissue stop. The necessity of this is somewhat debatable. But you can see what, what we're doing here. By making a, a small uh, slip, slit in the back part of the edentulous ridge. And actually, we're going over the ridge so that we get more than one plane. When this tray is placed back onto the cast or into the mouth, we are controlling the movement of the tray in the lateral directions. So once this has been completed, and I have another model that I've prepared earlier so we don't uh, take up too much time on the television tape, this is what we should end up with. Now, this has been polished with wet cotton. This is absolutely unnecessary, so don't uh, spend time polishing this. Now, here we have the two layers around the teeth, one layer in the entire edentulous portion of the cast, and the stops made in the wax so that uh, stone is exposed. At this time, we are all ready to uh, make the mix and actually make the acrylic resin tray. Now, I would suggest for this step that uh, it's better to have too much material ready than, than not enough. So what I've actually done, I'm using two units of the formant tray or the self-curing acrylic resin. And because this takes a couple of minutes to set, I'm going to just begin to make the mix and then we'll be back in a couple of moments and uh, show you how to make the, the doughy patty and actually adapt it to the cast that we have prepared. At this point, the material is nearing its working stage and the what I'm going to do, as we mentioned before in an earlier tape, I'm going to try to use the material a little bit earlier than normal by placing it and my fingers into some water first. And now, as you can see, I think I'll use a little more material. As I mentioned before, you're going to need more. This is a, this is a large tray. You're going to need more than you use for the other exercise where we made the uh, tray for the mandibular denture. Now, I have coated the exposed stone surfaces with the uh, alcohol. You can use just plain water or any separating medium that you like. The point, the trick here is to make a large patty and not too thin, three or four millimeters thick, that will cover the entire surface. And if you have the roller combination that Kerr makes, the roller where you can actually make a even patty of the material, why well, that is also a good way, although it's not absolutely necessary because uh, by doing it manually, such as I am doing here, it is possible, with a little practice, to make a very even thickness of the self-curing ac acrylic resin. Now, at this point, I'm covering all the surfaces. And you'll notice in the anterior portion, where a moment ago we talked about not having it too thick in the labial vestibule, and making sure that that is just that, that it is not too thick. And again, as with the wax, it is very easy to trap large bubbles of air. And if that happens, do the same thing we did with the wax. That is, go in and break the bubble, and expose the uh, inner surface, the air will escape, and simply readapt the acrylic resin at that time. Now, I can see some areas where the pink um, base plate wax is showing through, and that's getting a little too thin. 
And then at this time, to save yourself a lots of time at the, at the model trimmer or uh, at the lathe with your arbor chuck, at this time, go in and remove all the excess acrylic resin that you possibly can. And the more accurately you do this, uh, the more, the less time consuming will be the final stages of the preparation of the tray. So once this material has been removed, and this material is setting up quite rapidly under these hot lights. We make sure that everything has been fully adapted. Now, as we will see in a few moments, the final tray will end up a little short of the peripheries all the way around. But for the first step, I would suggest that you take the acrylic resin right down to the uh, peripheral borders where the uh, anatomy joins the boxing edge. Now, we will have a handle on this tray, and that can be done in two ways. Either at the same time you're adapting this portion, adapt the handle with, with some more of the material. With such a large tray as this, this is not always possible because you should spend really more time making sure that you have this tray well adapted than putting on the handle. The handle can be put on with a separate mix. Now, I won't demonstrate that, but um, I'll show you what the handle looks like on the final tray. Now, with a separate mix, uh, after this has set, or after it has reached the stage where it begins to get warm and there's no more need to adapt it, you can make a smaller mix of material, and when it becomes doughy, wet the surface in the anterior region and simply place your, uh, so it will uh, chemically bond to this tray and you can put your handle on the anterior portion. We'll talk more about the handle in a moment. It is important that the handle goes on the front where the teeth are. There will be a few cases, and there are every year, where people make the mistake of putting the handle in the back, and this is most uncomfortable for the patient, and it doesn't really help in getting the tray in and out of the mouth. So at this time, let's let this cure, and we will go on to the next step. When the acrylic resin has set, it can be removed easily, as long as we've blocked out the undercuts properly, and the wax will usually adhere to the cast. It depends on how soon you take it out. If, it is, if the acrylic tray is still very warm, the wax may adhere to the uh, acrylic resin tray itself, but that's not important. Uh, now, as you can see, the um, stops are very distinct and there is an excess of material all the way around the tray, which has to be removed with, and I would suggest, the arbor band on the lathe. I, I don't deem it necessary to uh, demonstrate that, but I will show you in the final tray how far that we go. And you will notice by looking carefully at your tray, it's very easy to see the limits of the uh, boxing edge and the uh, tray itself. So with the use of the arbor band at this point, we go uh, to the lathe and trim back the borders. And at this time, there would normally be a handle on the, the tray also. I have here the completed tray that we will make for this exercise. And the handle at this time has been added. And this will be in the glass case, so you can take a good look at it and get an idea of the placement of the handle as to location, uh, to the thickness of the handle. And you will also notice that the uh, trimming has been done. Now, this tray has not been polished, either with pumice or polishing material. Now, there will be a place where you'll need burrs, and that is the uh, notch for the labial frenum. And you'll notice that the tray uh, is full of holes. And this is to release pressure that is generated when delivering the impression material into the mouth and also uh, for mechanical retention of the irreversible hydrocolloid when used. Now let me place this on the cast so you can see the relationship between the borders and the uh, cast itself. And you can see as we go all the way around that the tray conforms to the general shape but it is short of the borders. And one reason for this is 
that in using the alginate material for impression, it characteristically overextends tissue. So actually the first step using this tray is not to go in and make the final impression, but what we will do is actually border mold the posterior part of the tray in the mouth. We normally find it unnecessary to border mold the anterior portions because we have incorporated this well enough in the preliminary impression. But this type of tray does give us the opportunity to go into the mouth and border mold the difficult areas in the posterior part of the impression. So that will be the first step. Now this completes the, um, uh, this part of the exercise and I, I would like every one of you after, after the project has been checked by your instructor to save this and then next year or in your senior year when you make your uh, immediate denture you can go back and take a look at how this tray was constructed and it will be helpful to you at that time. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu license.